Okay, I uh, just thought I'd spend some time going through some of the texts in our received version of Scripture. I know that most um, most of the time, if you go to church, they tend to focus more on Paul. And so I was wanting to look at some of these other um, books by the actual apostles themselves. And so I just thought I would start with 1 John chapter 1, just go through these various uh, books, because to be honest with you, I, I can't really say that I spent a whole lot of time in the books written by John and Peter. And so as I start studying these, I think, well, you know, maybe I should just make some videos and see what the Father reveals to me and, um, you know, share it with, with YouTube if if I get any kind of, uh, anything worth sharing, I guess. So we'll start in First John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. Now, this is the King James Version, by the way. I was going to use one of the other versions, and I figured, well, this is one that most people know. So notice right, right here, John is emphasizing which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. So he's emphasizing their first-hand experience with Yeshua, the word of life. He says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Yeshua Messiah. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Okay, so as I'm reading these verses, the thing that comes to mind is in the recognitions of Clement, or my apologies, I think it was actually the the um, homilies. Clint, uh, Keith has pictured as saying something very similar to this about um, about being the first-hand witnesses. Let me see if I can pull it up here. We will go through and. Let's see, here's the homilies. I'm going to pull it up and see if I can find it. And I don't remember the address, but I remember Kifa mentioning that his nickname, The Rock. Okay, here it is. So let's see if I can make this a little bit more narrow so it'll fit in here. Oops. not wanting to move. There it goes. Okay, so here is this passage in the uh, homilies. It's in book 17, chapter 19, and this is a chapter which I've read several times, and to me it stands out as being one where even though uh, Kepha is pictured as speaking to Simon Magus, these words could certainly be said to, to Paul. And I mentioned before that I see the Clementine homilies as being anti-Paul. So, and, and I've went through a detail, went through each one of the homilies and read them to you. So, and you can see those videos on my YouTube channel. <clears throat> but we'll read this chapter here. It says, If then our Yeshua appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you, and spoke to you, it was as one who is enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams, or through revelations, that were from without, that he spoke to you. So in the previous chapters right before this, the paragraphs right before this, Kepha is um, he, he's speaking about the Holy Spirit giving people wisdom. And he says that these revelations come from within you, like within your your heart, like Yahuwah will speak 
into your spirit, and so you have these revelations come up out of nowhere. But then he's saying, with this person whom, like I said, even though the text says that it's Simon Magus, I think this was something that Kepha actually said to Paul. He, because Paul is the one that emphasized that Yeshua appeared to you in a vision. Simon Magus, I don't believe in the homilies that, that he really says that about Yeshua, but of course Paul does. If Yeshua appeared to you in a vision, it was as one who was enraged with an adversary. It's not that he was speaking to Paul as a friend. He was speaking to him as if he was enraged, that he was an enemy. And it was for this reason that it was from revelations that were from without. So Paul did not have this revelation come into his heart. Yeshua appeared to him in a vision and stood before him and, and blinded him. So it was the revelation from outside of Paul that he spoke to you. But can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through apparitions? And if you will say it is possible, then I ask, why did our teacher abide and discourse a whole year to those who were awake? Okay, so here Kepha is emphasizing the fact that this person he's speaking to never met Yeshua personally, but he's asking, why did our teacher abide and discourse a whole year to us. So he's emphasizing his first-hand knowledge. He says, And how are we to believe your word when you tell us that he appeared to you? And how did he appear to you when you entertain opinions contrary to his teaching? But if you were seen and taught by him and became his apostle for a single hour, proclaim his utterances, interpret his sayings, love his apostles, contend not with me who accompanied with him, for in direct opposition to me, who am a firm rock, the foundation of the assembly, you now stand. Okay, so notice that this person that Keith is speaking to is claiming that he became his apostle. Became his apostle for a single hour. And this person apparently does not love his apostles. So this person is claiming to be made an apostle by Yeshua himself through a vision, but yet he does not love his apostles. He contends with Kepha. Now we see that in the book of Galatians that Paul had a contention with Kepha. And again, Kepha is emphasizing that he actually first-hand knowledge, first-hand direct um, knowledge of Yeshua, that he, he met him, he walked with him for a whole year. He says, for in direct opposition to me, who am a firm, firm rock, the foundation of the assembly you now stand. So it's somebody who has directly opposed Kepha. If you were not opposed to me, you would not accuse me and revile the truth proclaimed by me in order that I might may not be believed when I state what I myself have heard with my own ears from the Master, as if I were evidently a person that was con uh, condemned and in bad repute. So again, the emphasis is on that Kepha heard it from his own ears, from the Master himself. But if you say that I am condemned, you bring an accusation against Elohim, who revealed the Messiah to me, and you inveigh against him, who pronounced me favored on account of the revelation. But if indeed you really desire to work the cause of truth, learn first of all from us what we have learned from him, and become a taught one of the truth, and become a fellow worker with us. So this person is refusing instruction from the apostles themselves. He says, learn first from us what we have learned from him. Uh, Paul is the one who, in the book of the first chapter of Galatians, emphasized the fact that he did not learn anything from the apostles, that everything that he had came directly from Yeshua himself. So, I'm bringing this chapter up, this paragraph, because it reminds me, and we're going to close this, and I'll get out of this thing. Okay, so it's kind of the same thing. that he's John is opening up this by saying um, that it's what they, they themselves have handled with their own hands. They met Yeshua, they walked with Yeshua, they have first-hand knowledge of Yeshua. <clears throat> he says, 
And so the purpose of writing is that their joy may be full. So he's writing to an assembly of people, to other believers. This is the purpose for his letter, to increase their joy. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. Um, so again, this is their message. Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is similar to what Kepha says in the recognitions where he says anything written in, written in the scriptures that seems to paint Elohim in a negative light is false. That falsehoods have been asserted. And so here you hear, you see John emphasizing the same piece of information that Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. It's another way of saying what, what Kepha said. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua, Messiah, his son, cleans us from all evil, from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So anyone who's claiming to be immune from sin or to be sinless, John is saying, okay, this, is, this person's a liar. We've all sinned. But does that mean that we all sin and so then we go on sinning? No. No, he, he says that we should not be, um, we should no longer walk in the darkness. Doesn't mean that we're going to be necessarily sinless, but when we do sin, we repent and we confess our sins, and we avoid sin in the future. Yeshua himself said to go forth and sin no more. Okay, second chapter. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Again, see, you're turning away from sin. It doesn't mean we just say a sinner's prayer and that he loves us the way we are. It means that we say a sinner's prayer and we repent. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua Messiah, the righteous. And he is the appropriation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of Elohim perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Okay, so so here's the, you know, the emphasis. We keep his commandments. That's how we, th we know that we're in him. So what were Yeshua's commandments? Well, we know what's in the Bible. We know that the Torah gives us instruction for the way we live our lives. But then we also know that in the writings of Clement, Kepha speaks about things that were added to the Torah. And that's what Yeshua came to set us free from, is the commandments of men that have been inserted and taught as, as uh, commandments from Elohim, and they're really just the, the commandments and instructions of men. Now, one of the things that we know from history, even though it's more or less been written out of the Bible, it's not completely out of the Bible, but um, it's been certainly written over, is that Yeshua, his apostles, kept a vegetarian diet. We have numerous historical references to that fact, and that the Jewish Christian groups all ate a vegetarian diet. And, in fact, the Catholic Church persecuted the vegetarians and vegans, and that Paul himself wrote against it. Again, you know, a lot of the stuff that John and Keith is saying seems to be able to be tied back to Paul. And my theory, my contention has always been, not always, but recently, is that Paul was not really part of the original movement. I think for a time they thought that he was, they thought that he was one of them, but then probably about the time that 
Paul and Peter had that confrontation in the second chapter of Galatians is when Paul was revealed and that they began to realize that Paul was not on the same page as what they were teaching. <clears throat> he that saith he abideth in him himself also to walk even as he walked. So if Yeshua kept a particular diet, we should keep that same diet. If he kept a particular set of beliefs, we should also have those beliefs and we should practice the same type of life that he had. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you have which ye have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is, not, there is none occasion for stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So, now we're moving into this subject of there's somebody walking in darkness that hates his brother. I would invite you to read through the from the third chapter of Galatians on and you will see that when Paul's speaking about the other apostles, he seems rather hateful. You know, he introduces in, in the first two chapters of Galatians, kind of his introduction, he, he emphasizes that he learned nothing from the apostles. All that he learned came from direct revelation, according to Paul. He mentions the the three heads of the assembly, James, John, and Kepha, and he sarcastically remarks that they seemed to be pillars, but they meant nothing to him. And then he gets into this argument with Kepha because people from James came and there was a dispute. Now, the dispute seemed to be over table fellowship. Um, it, again, it seems like this dispute has something to do with food. And then the rest of the book of Galatians is keep, is Paul both defending himself against people who are asking, apparently asking for some kind of a certification or letters of recommendation certifying Paul as a true apostle, and at the same time ridiculing and condemning and calling names to the twelve apostles, specifically James, Kepha, and John. And as I've read the book of Galatians, to me it sounds like that it's a hate-filled book. Now a lot of times the translators will try and, uh, and play down the viciousness that uh, Paul is attacking the Jerusalem assembly, but essentially I mean, he's calling them names, he's calling them, sarcastically calling them super apostles and things like that, and uh, and defending himself and his own certification. Well, are they, am I not a Hebrew too? Am I not an apostle? You know, he says that he was the greatest of the apostles because he's the one that met the risen Yeshua in a vision. But John is sitting here saying that if you hate your brother, then you're walking in darkness. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him from the beginning. I, um, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And in the... Uh, hold on, I think my page skipped here a little bit. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him from... That is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of Elohim abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And so it's a little bit of a repetitive type of thing here. Um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, 
If any man loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, th this repetitive group of, of lines, this three sentences here, every time I read that, I wonder if that was a copyist error, like someone was copying the text, because I know that I've, I've handwritten out um, books in the Bible before to kind of to learn them better. And there have been times where I would be writing, I would stop to do something else, I would go back and start writing again and realize that I'd accidentally written a part of it twice. I almost wonder if that's what happened here with like a copyist. Um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So what is this lust of the flesh? Generally, we think of this as like uh, immorality, adultery, fornication, that sort of thing. But when I was reading this, the last time I read this book, the Father stopped me at this line, and the impression that I got was that this may actually be speaking about lusting after meat. Because, and let's see here, we'll go to, let me open up another window of Bible Gateway. Let's go to Numbers. Chapter 11. Hmm. So the people are um, contending with Moses. And they say, who shall give us flesh to eat? Now, keep in mind that this is when they're, they're out in the wilderness. Supposedly, they've got herds of cattle and sheep and goats with them. But for some reason, they're lusting after meat. Could it be that either, could it be that the Father was not allowing them to eat meat? We know in the first chapter of Genesis, it said that the original diet prescribed by Elohim was vegetarian. So we'll go to, go here, Genesis chapter 1. And I think it's right about, uh, to every beast of the field, to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps on the ground, wherein there is life, I've given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So, here we can see in these, these verses 29 through 31 that the, the entire creation, all the animals, not just man, but all the animals was eating a vegetarian diet. So, if we wanted to get back to the Garden of Eden, that would be the path to take to get back there. But here, the people are lusting after meat. Who shall give us flesh to eat? And we're not going to read the whole thing, but basically, uh, the Yahuwah gave them quail to eat. And the people were hit with a plague, possibly food poisoning. You know, we don't really know specifically what it was, but many people died. While the flesh was still between their teeth. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and Yahuwah smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of the place Kibroth Hata'awa, because there buried the people that lusted. So the people here were lusting after, where was it? Lusting after flesh. So, would this be the lust of the flesh? Could it be? I don't know that we could prove that it's what it was, but lust of the flesh. But I suppose we could try, we could search for it. Let's search for it. Lust for flesh. So, notice we have Numbers 11. Deuteronomy, 
kill and eat flesh, whatever thy soul lusteth after. I will eat flesh because thou so longest to eat flesh, thou must eat flesh, whatever thou thy soul lusteth after. So these first two references, first three references in the scripture are not about fornication, they're about lusting after eating flesh. Now we see Paul is turning the lust of the flesh into um and to, to more about just like fornication and sexual immorality. So there's a lot of connections here to, to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, um, despised government. Would this be the government of the world or would this be the government of the Jerusalem Assembly? I guess we'll get more into that when we turn to Second Peter. And here we see this lust of the flesh that we're reading of now. So, what if we go to this one in Romans? Romans 13, 14. We'll open the whole verse. 13, 14. This is the one where Paul the Herodian by birth is telling the people to obey government. He's basically a son of Caesar begging the people to obey Caesar, to obey himself. But he says, put, but put you on the master Yeshua Messiah and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And so we see that they're talking about Drunkenness, wantonness, strife, and envying. So you're like, oh, well, that has nothing to do with eating. Well, let's go to the very next chapter. The very next line says, Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to do doubtful mutations, disputations. For if one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So see, that was introducing this mention that Paul had of lust of the flesh is introducing this idea of vegetarianism. I found that to be an interesting connection there. Okay. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but as of the world. Talking about pride. Who is constantly defending themselves against the accusation of being boastful. Why don't you go and, uh, well, I guess we could do that here. Let's try that. Let's say boast. Boast. A lot of mentions in Psalms and Proverbs, but, um, Well, maybe it's a different word used in um, in uh, the book of Galatians, but Paul's one's always defending himself. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. Even so, our boasting which I made before Titus is, is found a truth. Wherefore, um, show ye to them, and before the church is a proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So the one that's always defending himself about boasting is Paul. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he doeth the will of Elohim abideth forever. So when it comes to the rapture, the one that's, that remains is the one that does the will of the Father. The evil is going to be raptured away, if you want to use that word, not the good. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time, or the end times. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out 
that they may be made manifest that they were not all of us. So somebody is going out from the apostles that, uh, what have I done here? Somebody's went out from the apostles claiming to be of the apostles. And John is saying that these people, these unnamed people, are not of us. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Yeshua is the Messiah? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledges the Son hath also the Father. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning, that it, if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and the Father. And this is a promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning them that seduce you. So this group, this uh, false apostles are seducing the people astray. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye not uh, that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth, teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him as at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So generally, when you see this word righteous or justice in, in regards to the apostles, that, in my mind, instantly brings James to mind, James the Just. Um, in fact, you know, it's in his nickname, the Just. <clears throat> so part of the purpose of this letter is not just to make their joy complete, but it's also to warn them of false apostles that are out there misrepresenting the true apostles. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of Elohim, because the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of Elohim, and doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we, that, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like unto him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgress the law, for the sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Okay, so... Anyone who's doing sin is not of the Father. Part of having Yeshua and accepting Yeshua is that we turn away from sin. Doesn't mean you won't make a mistake at some point, but there's a difference between making a mistake and repenting of it versus remaining in a lifestyle of sin. Little children, let no man deceive you that he, he that doeth righteous is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that come committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Elohim was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of Elohim doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of Elohim. <clears throat> so, if you are born of Elohim, you don't commit sin because the seed of the Father is dwelling within you. And this, the children of Elohim are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of Elohim, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So, Cain 
was essentially jealous of Abel because Abel was righteous, Cain slew him. I think this comes back to my own personal theory that um, Paul was responsible, at least in part, for the death of James. Because you see, um, in the book of Acts, you see that Paul is taken into the palace of Herod. Uh, he's living there under protection of the Herodian family, who were also Paul's relatives. And so he was there basically under, you could call it house arrest, but it was essentially protective custody. And then Paul is escorted back to Rome to meet with Nero. And while, almost immediately afterwards, you see that James is murdered. You don't see that in the book of Acts, but you do see it in um, Josephus. So James was murdered about that time, which is interesting that the book of Acts is completely silent about James's murder. But then immediately after James is killed, according to Josephus, Paul is back in Jerusalem. Josephus mentions Saulus and his brother Costobarus, who was relatives of Herod and were essentially criminals. And so it really makes you wonder, like, was Paul responsible for that? How was Paul right back in Jerusalem? And while some may say, well, it's possible that it was a different Paul who was a relative of Herod, but I don't, I don't, I think that's a little bit too much of a coincidence for it to really be tenable. So, um, Okay, so here it is. So Cain slew Abel because of his brother's righteousness. Marvel not, my brethren, the world hate you. If the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brethren abideth in death. So again, it's like I mentioned before, uh, that seems to tie back into Paul. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know not, ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of Elohim, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of Elohim in him? My little children, let not love let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure the hearts before him. For if our heart condemneth us, Elohim is greater in our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemneth us not, then we have the confidence toward Elohim. And whosoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do not and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Yeshua Messiah, and to love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and we hereby know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Okay, so what is this about the Spirit condemning you? Well, if you are holding back aid from your brother, that you, you know, if you have the ability to help your brother and you're shutting up your, your generosity toward him, then it's a heart problem. And so if you look in the book of Genesis where it speaks about the heart of man was desperately wicked, who can know it? But then the prophet Jeremiah says that Yahuwah is going to give us a heart of flesh, and so we're going to get a new heart with the um, Torah written on that heart. And so... If you are withholding aid from your brother out of your own selfishness, then that is in itself evidence that you don't have this new heart. And if you don't have this new heart, then you are not um, abiding in Elohim. You're still abiding in the flesh. You haven't, you know, to put it in like uh, Christian terminology, as proof that you have not been saved. So it sounds like it takes more than just saying a sinner's prayer for salvation. 
beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Okay, so it sounds like that there is a false spirit. Not every, whole, not every spirit is the Holy Spirit. It almost sounds like that there is a counterfeit going around. <clears throat> hereby we know that the spirit, hereby know ye the spirit of Elohim, every spirit that confesseth, confesseth that Yeshua, Messiah, is come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that confesseth not that Yeshua, Messiah, is come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So, what if we were to search for um, let's say flesh? It's probably going to be too many. Yeah, there's a lot of scriptures. What about manifest? I don't think I should have misspelled it. Manifest. Manifest the flesh. Okay, here we go. Romans 8. Now, of course, Romans is one of the epistles by Paul that's widely regarded to be true. Um, or be, be genuine. You know, some of the others, like the Timothys, are most universally regarded to have been written by someone else um, claiming to be Paul. But Romans, uh, Corinthians, Galatians, they're all widely regarded as as genuine letters from Paul. For what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh, Elohim sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So you can make the argument that Paul was denying that Yeshua came in the flesh. He said he was in the likeness of flesh. Now some other people say, well, he's just saying he looked like he was sinful. You know, the, the Yeshua wasn't actually sinful flesh. He was pure flesh. And that may be a, a valid point, but I, I tend to think that Paul here seems to be saying that Yeshua was in the appearance of flesh, but not actual flesh itself. <clears throat> Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is of Elohim, and every spirit that confesseth not that Yeshua came in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of Elohim, and he that knoweth Elohim heareth us, and he that is not of Elohim heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, so this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of Elohim, and everyone that loveth is born of Elohim and knoweth Elohim. He that loveth not knoweth not Elohim, for Elohim is love. In this was manifest the love of Elohim toward us, because that Elohim sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved Elohim, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the procreation for our sins. Beloved, if Elohim so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen Elohim at any time. If we love one another, Elohim dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, 
and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Okay, so essentially the point is that if you're not manifesting love, um, it's questionable as to whether you are of Elohim. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to, the, to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Yeshua is the Son of Elohim, Elohim dwelleth in him, and he in Elohim. And we have known and believed the love that Elohim hath to us. Elohim is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in Elohim, and Elohim in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love ca casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say that I love Elohim and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love Elohim, whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have from him, that he who loveth Elohim loveth his brother also. Whosoever believeth that Yeshua is Messiah is born of Elohim, and every one that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of Elohim, when we love Elohim and keep his commandments. For this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So, who is it that teaches against keeping the commandments? If you don't keep the commandments or if you teach against keeping the commandments, then you do not have this love of Elohim. For whosoever is born of Elohim overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yeshua is the son of Elohim? This is he that came by water and blood, even Yeshua Messiah, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are, in, are one. Okay, so this is a widely regarded to be a false, um, a false insertion in the Scripture. So, like, if we go to the New American Standard, it re reads much different. For there, there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So this actually lines up better with what was being said before, with the emphasis on this, the water and the blood. Um, here it is. Who came by water and blood. So this matches what Seven is saying. It doesn't have the, the false trinity doctrine inserted. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of Elohim is greater, for the testimony of Elohim is this, that he has testified concerning his son. We'll skip back to the King James Version. He that believeth on the son of Elohim hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not Elohim hath made him a liar, because he believeth not in the record that Elohim gave of his son. And this is the record that Elohim gave us uh, hath given us to eternal life and this life of his son. He that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of Elohim hath not life. <clears throat> so that's something in one of my more recent presentations I was saying is that you, the only way to interpret scripture, the only way to really know the truth is through the instructions of Yeshua. And so if we're holding to a doctrine that is not taught by Yeshua, there's a good chance we're holding on to falsehood. These things I have written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of Elohim, that you may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of Elohim. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that, we, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know 
that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that he hath the petitions, that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life. For of them that sin is not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Okay, let's read this again. If any man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. So there's some sins that are not sins unto death and others that are. He shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. <clears throat> so I guess this ask will be you need to pray for your brother. If he's in a sin, but it's not a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So if he's sinning a sin unto death, you don't need to pray for him, I guess. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of Elohim sinneth not, but he that is begotten of Elohim keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And if we know that we are of Elohim in the whole world, lieth in wit and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of Elohim has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know that him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Yeshua Messiah. This is the true Elohim and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. So this is almost like a, a sudden ending. Keep yourself from idols. So I'm wondering if this idol is the sin unto death. So if you're worshiping idols, it's the sin unto death. And if someone's worshiping idols, there's no point in praying for them. But for other sins, um, you should pray for your brother that he may turn from the sin. That is, if I'm understanding what John's saying correctly. But this is the end of First John, and so I'm just going to post this to my YouTube channel, and um, we'll go on with Second John um, sometime soon. So uh, thank you for, for listening, and I hope that this has given you some things to think about, and you have a good afternoon. Shalom.